Hey, this is WP DevTable. Uh, we're at episode 12 now. We're going to be talking about WordCamp Asheville and WordCamps in general with Julian Melissa. Uh, we are a weekly hangout podcast. You can subscribe to us at wpdevtable.com slash subscribe. Uh, subscribe on YouTube. Give us five stars on iTunes. Follow on Twitter. And I think that's all the things. There might be more. Uh, anyway, I'm Tom Harrigan, uh, coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. I'm here with Jason Resnick from Queens. Say hey. How's it going, Tom? What's up? Uh, and we're here with Julian Melissa. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Julian? Yeah, hey everybody. And first of all, thanks to these guys for having me on. Um, I am a web developer. <laughs> Probably a lot of the people that you get on this show. But um, yeah, I would say I'm a kind of full stack, mostly front end web developer. Uh, I'm based out of Asheville, North Carolina. Currently taping this from my roommate's room, which used to be my kind of recording studio, home studio, but um, we're not done building that in the basement yet. So, uh, sorry. Also, if there's dogs, just as a disclaimer, barking that would be my two uh, runs. So, yeah, basically, I've got um, a couple things to talk about with you guys today, and I know you guys wanted to cover a bunch of stuff, but um, I'm also an organizer of WordCamp Asheville. Uh, which just finished up today, and um, uh, also just you know, like I said, front end developer. I'm on the Roots team actually uh, for the root for the Sage theme, as well as uh, Bedrock and Trellis, which I don't have a ton of um, involvement in. But um, yeah, second nerd podcast. So thanks again for having me on. Right on. Always fun to nerd out. Uh, <laughs> also, if you're listening in live, you can uh, tweet us with the hashtag AskWPDevs, and we'll get your questions on the show live. So, uh, so yeah, Asheville happened this weekend, right? And that was pretty yep. awesome. Uh, that was my yeah. first time to Asheville. Uh, Julian and I met at WordCamp Rally back in 2013. So uh, it's just a pretty good state overall, right? Uh, so what was the attendance of uh, WordCamp Asheville this year and how it compares to last year? Yeah, so um, last year's attendance, I'm pretty sure, was somewhere right over 200 people. Um, and some people may or may not be aware, but we get um, we have outstanding sponsors and and splendid sponsors, and basically the WordCamp Foundation gets a bunch of sponsors to sponsor um, like nationwide or globally, um, and then they commit a certain amount per attendee. Every 50 attendees, um, I think, is the amount that we get when we get a, a price break. So every 50 attendees, we get a little bit more per attendee. So last year. It was our first year. We really we wanted to make sure we didn't overdo it, so we had 200 people. Um, I think it ended up being more like 211 or 15 with the organizers um, and a couple of volunteers. This year we decided to go up to 265. Um, the venue was able to fit a lot more, but again, with the new venue comes a lot of new uh, problems and issues, and so we wanted to kind of play it safe this year. Um, last year I think we sold out in two and a half weeks. This year we sold out in about a week and a half, um, so that was good. I guess the demand is still growing. So next year we're we've already talked about it. We're really hoping to be able to up that number a good bit and um, maybe even reach the max capacity of whatever UNCA will allow. Nice. I know it's a bit early, but do you think it's going to be a similar or the same uh, organizing team? Yeah. Last year the organizing team was I actually I think exactly the same. Um, it's kind of a balance between who freelances and has enough time to, to do the meetings during the day versus like after work every day. Um, that was kind of a barrier for us for some and for some of the organizers the first year. Um, but yeah, as long as nothing changes, I think next year will be a similar team of organizers. Um, and I think it's about nine, I don't know if you're about to ask me this, but it's about nine or ten organizers in general. Um, we have one lead core organizer. Um, we have um, that's that's Lydia Roberts. Um, we have Lisa. Um, she is kind of like second second. I would say second in charge because she handles all the awesome budget stuff, so that we don't have to think about that. Uh, it's a huge component of it. And then I tend to be kind of a like uh, just go around and do everything and try to find sponsors person. So we have a couple like I would say more involved organizers, and then we have organizers that show up at every meeting. And then we have, uh, apart from that, more volunteers that kind of get sub-managed by some of our organizers. It takes a lot of people to put on a, a good, a big, good WordCamp word event, but also be able to 
keep your job. <laughs> sure. And the, org the uh, volunteers are doing everything from uh, introducing speakers to like helping people mm -hmm. find their way. What else yeah. do they do? Yeah, so we have some moderators. Um, we have people helping to find their way or helping people park uh, during the event. Um, we had a couple off off the scenes volunteers as well. Um, this year we had a couple volunteers help manage the speaker sponsor dinner with me and um, that's always a totally separate event that doesn't really get um, managed or seen by most of the attendees um, but we want to make sure that we thank all the people coming out and flying like you um, flying down to come and visit and um, she was really amazing she was able to get like all the paper plates and all that just like random stuff that we really needed um, and so that we could all focus on getting the conference done um, and uh, that was that's definitely like an integral job there's also we had a really stellar design team this year um, those volunteers are kind of all these volunteers that end up helping a lot but don't go to the main meetings are, are like super volunteers we like to call them and they're the ones who get a ticket for the weekend, but they are putting in a ton of work beforehand. Um, so uh, then they, and the design team just did an amazing job this year. Uh, I was really impressed. Totally. I'm rocking out the shirt. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> cool. Nice. So, so you, you mentioned, you, I'm sorry, Jason. Are you I, say I just, yeah. You, you mentioned, Julian, that you were, you were responsible for going out and getting the sponsors. Is, that was your role? Yeah, I think a lot of people. Um, I think a lot of people go out and get sponsors. We kind of assigned a lot of people. Um, I will say this year, um, for one reason or another, I ended up getting a lot of the sponsors that actually came on and <laughs> and and decided to give us some money um, or in kind sponsorship levels. Um, part of that is just the fact that I end up. Um, being pretty aggressive about emailing and staying on top of it and doing it early on. Um, it was really important this year. Uh, last year our venue was donated to us, so we need a, a certain amount of money. Um, this year we had to pay a lot for the venue as well as for the food. Um, with that came the fact that I wasn't there at like 8 o'clock breaking down or setting up at night, um, and they did all that work for us, but also came that way larger price tag. So we had to be a little bit more aggressive about um, about sponsorship in general, and for one reason or another, I just ended up with <laughs> a lot of the sponsors saying yes to me. <laughs> well, it's a good thing. Right? Absolutely, yeah. 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 Definitely. Uh, there's always a lot of variables in organizing the WordCamps, and usually seems to be an iterative process of just trial and error and figuring out what works and what doesn't. So, like, what were some of the huge successes that you see as far as you know the organizing team went this year, and things just, that just really clicked well? Yeah, one, one thing that went well is, um, in general, we were a lot better about, because we had done this before, we were a lot better about delegating tasks out to people like those super volunteers, as well as um, figuring out, okay, we need help with this one thing. Let's go try to find it so that we don't have to do that and we can concentrate on um, trying to managing the whole event. Um, last year, I think I ran around a ton and was really frantic and worried about the internet and worried about a ton of other things. Um, and... Luckily, uh, we we were able to break out a little bit. So the design team was able to kind of meet once a week or once every other week when we got closer to the event, work on the T-shirts, but I didn't have to do anything with that. Um, there were a lot of other people that were just super helpful, so I would say that was one of the wins. Uh, another, another thing we did really well, I think, this year was the space. Uh, last year, the space was a little challenging, like I said, it was donated to us by AB Tech um, out in Inca College. Um, it was really great. It was a little bit further away, though, um, so I definitely think I, I definitely think that it was um, it, it was cramped. It was it was small, and we kind of had to f like work around a lot of the venue issues, um, some separate buildings, and actually like firewalls, <laughs> like not. Sorry, not internet firewalls, but like actual building firewalls. We weren't allowed to put cables between them, and it was really difficult getting around some of those things for a smaller venue. So this year, one of the big wins was absolutely WordCamp um, being at UNC Asheville. Um, and like I said, we did have to pay for it, but totally worth it. They were very professional. Um, the internet was meant to handle a lot of people. Um, it was just, it was just amazing working on that. Um, 
and not having to deal with every single little thing from the coffee. I remember we had like a bunch of those little coffee machines and they took care of the coffee this year. They made sure everybody was fed. They made sure everybody had snacks. They made sure we had tables for the dev panels like when we told them we needed them 15 minutes beforehand. Um, so that was, I would say the biggest thing was that. Um, the other thing was those rooms were just awesome. They were really well Acoustics were really good. We had no issues getting people to find them. And the happiness bar this year was something we really wanted to focus on and get people in more. And by placing that in the middle of this, like, really nice big sunlit room, um, we had a ton of happiness bar participation, and uh, it was just a general good good hangout space. Nice. It was nice that Jetpack came. Sorry, go ahead, Jason. No. I was just going to say, so our next year, you got to try to do it in the same venue? This way, kind of like what it seems like, you know, the word camps are going to do from now on is kind of yeah. like do venue, you know, after each year. Yeah. At the same venue. Right. You, you got to try to find the right venue, I think. Um, mm. Asheville is limited in some ways. I don't think a lot of people knew about Asheville even five years ago. Uh, probably not when I moved here, about 10, 10 15 years ago. So we... We're not really built for conference space. Like, there's no big, huge college town. Like, I mean, at UNC Asheville is the biggest college here. Other than that, we have community colleges that have smaller lecture halls. Um, hotels are always really, really expensive. And I've talked with a lot of the hotel people, and they really... Internet is very important to me, and I know that a lot of times internet just sucks at WordCamps, but I really try really hard. Being the person in charge of that particular task, I try really hard to make sure that we get reliable internet. A lot of hotels have flat out told me, like, I don't think we can support 350 devices in a room, and so I keep I keep searching. Um, the hotels are also more expensive. So I think next year there, there are a couple issues that... There are a couple issues that we're having in general, but overall... UNCA, uh, their their benefits greatly outweighed the issues, and I think we are definitely considering coming back. So, yeah. Cool. I think it was definitely a plus that uh, a good handful of Jetpack people came by, uh, you know, were there, and were able to go and, you know, sit around and stay in the Happiness Bar area and provide support yeah. to people, answer questions and stuff. Yeah, one good thing about the Happiness Bar in particular was um, I actually put Jeff Bowen. He's a local um, automatician here in Asheville. He actually lives right across from where I grew up, my dad's house, um, which is kind of weird. But, um, yeah, basically I put him in charge of the Happiness Bar because he knows all the folks at Jetpack and Automatic. And um, we actually had more coming. They weren't able to make it. We had two or three more automaticians that weren't able to make it. Um, but... I know that we we really wanted to focus on that this year, and I think we did a good job at keeping that staffed and keeping people uh, really engaged by putting it in the middle. And yeah, I was really happy to see Jetpack come out and bring all those people. And I know a lot of people got a really good help. Totally. Uh, I noticed. Well, yeah, I didn't go, but I saw that you guys did the pre-camp uh, this year, and I think that's kind of a neat thing that a lot of camps are doing, kind of doing the beginner sessions a day before the rest of the camp and the session start. So yeah. this was your first time doing that, right? Actually, we did it last year, and um, we liked it so much that that's why we did it again this year. Um, I personally like it a lot because, again, my job is like AV and Internet stuff. Mm -hmm. So I get to test the whole conference in that space. Uh, not like we could any <laughs> move anywhere with that much notice, but uh, we were able to test the space and kind of test it out um, and work out some kinks before the total event. Um, that definitely was a thing. We we I got I talked with IT the first day. We had some issues. Um, we figured some things out. Um, on top of that, it's all volunteers for the facilitators. So we have the hour. I'm sure the hourly combined rate of everybody helping their little tables is pretty high. And everybody's able to get all of this support for. I think we charged only twenty dollars for the pre camp. Um, and SiteGround actually donated three months of free hosting. Um, which I'm, I'm a big, usually a big fan of high, uh, site ground for, especially for the needs of some of these people just kind of starting out maybe their blog or their small business site. And we're able to get someone from, you know, zero to not 60, but zero to like 40 or 20 miles an hour. And uh, they're able to get to at least have something started um, so that the rest of the weekend they can be improving on that site or uh, they're at least a little more familiar with the, the concepts. 
Nice. So what did you want to put forth to the community and hope that they would get out of the WordCamp Azure? Probably it's a kind of two-part. We've got WordCamps are cool because they're not just like developer conferences. Um, they're also for everybody. So we, we have kind of two parts of the community in Asheville. I think we have um, a development community that is not necessarily um, – we're, we're starting to be much more of a thriving community. There's not a ton of us. It's not like we're in the research triangle here in, in North Carolina or, you know, San Francisco. There's a lot of people that are still learning to catch up and get get their chops up for development and, and stay relevant. So we're, we're able um, – I mean, I guess one of our goals is to kind of improve that community, get them to be able to do that, and also get them to uh, learn some things that they normally wouldn't be exposed to. Um, on the other hand, we've got the uh, small business owners, um, people who are travel bloggers and food bloggers, and you know we got a big food scene and, and beer bloggers because we got the big beer scene and hikers and photographers. Um, those people are often not the most technical, and so if we're able to give them some knowledge to, I guess you know move forward with whatever they want to do, um, it's a super good feeling um, to make sure that they can they can do that and at such a low cost too. On the point of uh, bringing new knowledge into the community, we were kind of talking a little bit, I think mostly Sunday about it, but yeah. about the value of uh, having local speakers versus having speakers come in. And yeah. it's, it's, uh, the word camps tend to be kind of local events, right? But yeah. so are the meetups that occur every <laughs> month during the year. Right. And you usually have mostly local speakers and a local audience. So if all speakers were local speakers, then it's kind of just like having a bigger meetup. And <laughs> right. there tends to be a, a lot of value in bringing in speakers from elsewhere so that you're bringing something new into the community rather than just having another community event, so helping things grow. Uh, but as far as I understand, WordCamp Central wants to have a lot of local speakers as well. Uh, do you know more like how many of them they want to be local? Yeah, there. so it's, it, it is an interesting thing we were talking about. Sunday, and I had never really, actually, like, really thought of it very hard. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it up. Um, we, we are, like, as a WordCamp, we're obviously kind of not bound to rules by Central, but w there's suggestions that are given to us from Central to kind of help us along. It's super helpful for the first year. The second year, it's really good to have them, you know, but we kind of know what we want to do. And um, I think that number is supposed to be, over 60 or 70 percent. Um, I think it's at least 50 percent. Um, vetting speakers is really hard, especially when your WordCamp becomes kind of popular. So if you have a lot of people who want to come, like this year we did, um, it's really hard to turn people down that you know are good speakers or something like that. Um, this year our criteria was definitely partially based off of that um, definitely partially, I say, but it was it was based off of that idea of having some local speakers. We also focus on trying to get um, um, women in tech more involved, and so we we do factor that in as part of our um, uh, criteria. But it's super important, especially in my opinion, as a developer who's learned so many things from others um, and by traveling to word camps outside of Asheville. Um, that we do bring in some of that knowledge. I mean, some of the companies in town, like the budgets in here for a lot of agencies are, are a lot lower than they are some other places like Atlanta or um, Raleigh or New York City. So we get the talent of these more enterprise or, or more busy popular devs, um, and they're kind of helping, not, not just devs, but they're kind of helping to help us all level up and kind of get an idea um, that there's other things out there and, and different techniques and different ways to do it. Um, our meetup, you know, you said the thing about a really big meetup. Our meetup group is 320 people, so we, we couldn't even fit them in there. Not all of them come every day. It's usually 30 to 40. But our meetup group is almost, it's primarily beginners. So for me especially, and towards that goal of getting local devs to kind of um, learn some new things and get exposed to some newer technologies, it's super important for me to get the devs in here from all over the place. And um, this guy gave a talk on getting, you know, five, six-figure jobs. And I, that was a very well-attended talk, and rightly so, because in Asheville we don't have a ton of those. And I think people were really intrigued and interested to learn from somebody from somewhere else about that.
How many first-time uh, speakers did you have? And that's that's another thing we we do try to do. Uh, first time WordCamp speakers, I would say, I think this year we had 40 speakers. Um, I would say five to 10 of them were probably first time speakers, at least WordCamp speakers. Um, some people put like, like we asked them if they had any previous <laughs> speaking experience. They put like, yeah, I've spoken in front of clients or in front of those kind of things. So it's, it's a little bit different uh, how you want to rate that. Um, I personally think it's really important. The first time I got an opportunity to, to speak, which I found out that I loved doing, was at WordCamp Raleigh, um, where I gave a talk on advanced custom fields, actually. And um, it was really, it was really nice to have somebody accept that and give me a chance. So we want to do that with our speakers as well. And on the same, at the same time, we always get feedback that some speakers don't seem very well vetted, or seem like they, you know, maybe we could have filled that slot a little better. Um, part of it is there's a low price tag, so we want to get people in the door, but we also want to expose people. Um, and we, I think we, it's hard finding that balance of quality presentations and um, engaging the community a little bit more. Sure. What were, what were some of your favorite sessions or topics this weekend? Um, I actually had a really fun time with Tom's. I might be guilty of trying to get his talk in there <laughs> so that I could uh, see it. The game gamification stuff and all the Ajax front end stuff and kind of pushing WordPress to do not normal things are always fun things. Um, I like to see uh, that that talk that I actually saw about bringing your um, uh, projects higher and your rates higher so that you're landing five, six-figure jobs um, was very interesting. I think as a developer, I think of things a little bit differently, and my agency is kind of like a one-time, like we build these uh, very custom applications or very custom websites, and he had this different uh, perspective of where he kind of used a similar formula and just kind of found bigger and bigger clients, and so it's always interesting to hear a sales sales marketing person's perspective um, on, on that. Um, I also, I really enjoyed the, the keynote. It wasn't, we're, we're, with the keynotes I've noticed, uh, Asheville doesn't try to necessarily like wow anybody or make them super insanely inspired to go like learn something or jealous of like some super rich person who did really well and <laughs> maybe they're not there quite yet. Um, uh, Carrie Dills um, did a really good job just getting people engaged first thing in the morning, which I know is always hard to do. She kept it short, so it was really easy for people to get what she was saying. And um, she was also just playing off of our theme of connections. So um, she did a really good job at kind of reinforcing that for us and getting people excited to start the weekend, um, and, but not also not just like dropping a huge ton of knowledge because that's what the, the rest of the day is for and then the next day. <laughs> So you mentioned you're at an agency. What kind of stuff are you doing there? Yeah, so um, my agency is called CraftPeak. I started that this year, uh, the first of the year, with uh, my business partner, designer, friend, uh, Corey Bullman. Um, we are a, I guess, I guess, you know, you could say the boutique agency thing. It's just a two-man shop, really. Um, we bring in other help as needed, and we'll probably talk about that more. But um, what, what do we do? We do custom, very custom website projects, usually more heavily on the theme development side, making them really pretty, making them do what they need to do. Um, we do custom plugin development, usually with to help add that functionality to the theme. Um, we also have, uh, we just finished a project in January, and that's actually what made us want to start the company. Um, him and I worked together for maybe three years before we started it, but um, we just finished building a front end for a application that's used all over the United States for United Ways. Um, it's a volunteer management system, so a VMS. I don't know how many exist out there, but um, basically we helped kind of take their initial design, initial product that they have been using for a long time and bring it up to uh, 2015 standards with uh, regarding to like mobile design and working well on different devices and also just 
the UI UX component is a huge thing for us. It's probably the reason why most people hire us. Um, I would say the dev skills are good. Uh, a lot of the heavy back-end stuff I, I hire out, not because I can't do it, but because I feel like there's a lot of other people who can probably do it better. And um, that way, Corey and I can focus a lot on the client's needs and UX and UI uh, specifically. Um, I think we pride ourselves on making stuff that you can kind of open up and use right away. You don't need a ton of training. <laughs> Very cool. So um, were you making that into a mobile application, or was that uh, like, you know, a, a responsive application, I guess? Yeah, so it's it's a, a kind of a multi-step process. Um, when they first contacted us, they said, you know, I think we want a mobile application. They actually came to me because they said, you know, we need, we need to get people on their phones and we need a mobile app. And I kind of evaluated their needs and realized the current system needed to be upgraded first. Um, while we did that, what I what I what we did for them was kind of create some reusable patterns. So I actually extended Bootstrap, like I started with Bootstrap, but extended it so much that it wasn't Bootstrap anymore. I kind of gave them their own Bootstrap framework. Um, with a lot, a lot of documentation. Um, the application's written with, uh, I think, like Cake PHP or Code Igniter, one of those PHP frameworks. Um, and uh, we didn't get a lot of opportunity to uh, rebuild the front end for them in, in like a mobile application API kind of way. So the first step was to get them a front end that everybody could use no matter what device they're on. It was also much easier to use. Um, I think there's definitely, there's talks of in the future, once they get enough people using the new thing, we're going to do a complete, they're going to do a complete back end rewrite in more of an API fashion. And then I'm going to be able to go back and translate my designs and probably tweak them a little bit, uh, translate all the front end work to a mobile application that we can then bundle up like with PhoneGap or, um, you know, Cordova or something like that. So when you, when you said more of an API-driven uh, application there, would that backend be written in WordPress and you'd be getting to use the WP <laughs> API or...? So I'm sure we're all used to this as WordPress developers. The backend developer <laughs> is not a huge fan of WordPress, uh, as far as I know. Um, he is really smart. He's a little grumpy. So when I've mentioned, you guys actually had an episode on grumpy developers, so um, <laughs> he's, he's definitely a grumpy developer. Uh, Jim, Jim's great, though, and he really does get stuff done. He's been so in that application, I almost think that he would be, he would be able to build it faster from scratch than he would be to learn all the WordPress stuff. So honestly, it, it probably won't be built in WordPress. Um, Corey and I did help them get on a uh, WordPress platform for some of their client sites, like United Ways all need a website as well. So we helped them get that system up and going uh, kind of in tandem when we were redoing this uh, application for them. And no, I, I, d I doubt they're going to put it in WordPress based on what I know about Jim and what he thinks. Um, but the API-based approach is still going to be extremely important, I think. Um, them separating their data from their presentation, the, hand, the handoff was, was really difficult. Um, there were, I mean, I had to have my own Git repository just for the HTML, the CSS, the, at the time I was using Grunt, the Grunt file. Um, I had to have my own repository, and then every time I made a change to that repository, Patrick, their, their front-end dev, who, who knows the back-end system better, would have to make, would have to make a change over there. So we had a weird handoff where like I would, I would find a bug and then I would have to put in like all caps in the commit message like, hey, you need to remember to update this thing because I changed it from what I gave you a month ago. Um, we, we could have avoided that if I had just been able to grab the data, uh, build the whole front end and then put it back. Um, they, they said getting me on, like getting me a VM set up and like getting me used to the way their application was set up wasn't going to be worth the time and that it would just be worth uh, the time for Patrick to take the time and like implement every single HTML CSS file. So uh, I think when we redo it, it'll be better 
for for a lot of reasons all around. Yeah. It sounds rough that you had to just suck <laughs> that up and deal with that. Well, and and you know it it was it is what it is. Uh, they ended up doing a really good job. There are still a few things on the application where I've noticed I go back and I'm like, I need to fix that thing. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but it is working well for them. And I guess at the end of the day, that's that's probably what counts. We can talk about ideologic development all day, but um, getting a product out of the door, getting customers really excited to use it. Um, they have a line out the door right now of customers wanting to existing customers wanting to switch over to the new version, and just that just kind of it makes it all worth it for me. Um, the struggle struggle is worth it. <laughs> nice. Uh, sticking on the topic of APIs, you've at least gotten yeah. to play with WP API on your own, and you know yeah. make sure that you're on top of things once it does hit core. So right. what kind of stuff have you been playing with and what kind of JavaScript script frameworks do you like using? Yeah, so um, I was I was most excited for this weekend because of the dev panel I was able to be on uh, about APIs. Um, we had some really sharp people on that and um, it, it was really interesting to hear them talk about some of the new stuff coming down the pipeline for the API. Uh, it got me a little bit more excited when I heard some things about version 2 being a little bit easier to work with. Um, I think when I had played around, I had played around with version 1, and I was actually trying to figure out if I should use it. Um, and at the time, there was kind of a conflicting amount of answers getting, like, what's my post type, or how do I get a custom post type, how do I get custom meta, how am I going to grab all that stuff? And I ended up just being like, ah, I think I might just roll my own because I can grab something from the database, bring it back together, and make a little endpoint and just, you know, JSON and code. So, or WP JSON and code. So, you know, I felt like there was, it was hard because it was in so much flux at the time. I wasn't comfortable with using it on a client application. And so, like you said, my only real experience with the API is just playing around with it, trying to keep it installed. Um, so on your JavaScript frameworks topic, um, I know we talked about this in the dev panel. Um, I personally have experience using um, Angular and Ember.js. Um, I have played around with React, but still less than I've played around with the API, which isn't much. So um, the topic intrigues me, but I'm definitely no um, genius on the matter. I'm actually probably not a really good Angular or Ember dev, but uh, after spending a couple months in both, um, it has been interesting seeing the differences in frameworks. Um, Ember, I think, is one thing we talked about, um, Micah Wood and I talked about in the um, panel because we both have a lot of experience um, with it. Ember is very rigid, so the API that WordPress is going to serve up by default and even a home build API is a little bit harder to get it to, to play nice. Um, it expects a very ideological build out. Like you got to do a ton of planning. You got to know exactly what your data looks like. Um, it is, it can be flexible to some changes, but I do think it's one of those things that the back end team and the front end team need to be really uh, if it's not the same person, um, need to be really together about how things are going to work, how things are going to run, who's going to handle the validation, how's that going to be done. That said, the organization and the convention over configuration concepts from Ember are amazing. They're definitely something that um, any developer can learn from to try to clean up their code. Ember CLI is an absolutely amazing uh, build tool and build process. It works really well. Um, and I, I will say I, I got caught in a bad space with this project that I recently used Ember on. I started it right before they said they were gonna do 2.0 as soon as they as soon as they could, and I didn't re I didn't realize they would actually like get it done so fast. Um, the road to 2.0 has been very quick, and the updates have been outstanding. The problem was is I'm over here trying to learn Ember. 1.3 or 2 or something like that and meanwhile everything's changes and you know I, I go to upgrade my Ember CLI and I have like 50 deprecation notices and I'm like oh god so that project I actually hand built an API in the client side and I was already overdue 
and I was just like, all right, I, this is a point where, and this has been a really, this was a really hard time in, in my development career, and it's actually was, uh, it's still very recent. So um, there was one weekend where I sat down with some developer friends, and I was just like, guys, I don't know exactly what to do about this. The changes are happening so fast. I feel like I, I'm not doing a good job. Um, I want to make sure that the product that I hand off is really good, but I also need to make sure it's maintainable. And um, I don't necessarily work on just one project. Like, I have a client project. I complete the needs, and then I uh, hand it off. And they might use it for a couple months before I even get to look at it again. I realized that Ember, particularly because of all the changes and because I had no real backend that was separate, I was actually using, like, JSON files in the, in the browser, uh, what they would call fixtures, it's usually Mirage, actually, which fakes an API. But anyways, I ended up getting <laughs> rid of that entire application, and we figured, me and my, me and my friend sat down, and he's just super back-end whiz. Like, he's a really good WordPress developer, um, really good Drupal developer. He can build whatever you want, whenever you want. And I was like, man, I think we need to redo this. And he goes, let's just build an API on WordPress. So I handed him... Um, desired JSON schema, which is like my favorite thing to do. I just hand him, this is what I went back from the API. And I handed him the database schema I had come up with. And he actually, him and I sat, sat. we have an office together, even though we don't work at Craft Peak together, uh, kind of like a co-working space. And we actually just sat at our computers, kind of staring at each other. Um, he just knocked it out. One day, we had this JSON API provided by WordPress, um, not using the WordPress API again because it's somewhat in flux and the client didn't pay for an API, so we didn't want them to have to necessarily do updates, like plugin updates and stuff. Um, and I, uh, I just went ahead and installed Sage and added Angular and just started going at it, building some page components out. And then once we had a, a plugin done with the API endpoints. I just started working on it, and uh, really interesting experience. It's one of those times where, you know, if you'd asked me before that if I would have built it in WordPress from scratch, I would have been like, oh, I don't know, because I've had a lot of fun with Laravel too. But at the end of the day, I need to open this up in a couple months. I can open up WordPress and feel really comfortable using it because that's something that I've spent all my time in. Sorry good. for the long story. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's good. It's good to hear because it's like, you know, just to, with all the various JavaScript frameworks out there, I mean, I've, yeah. I've dabbled in React mm -hmm. more than more than any of the other ones, but it's it's like, which one do you choose, right? <laughs> and like, it's like, I don't know, okay, the, the amount of posts out there of React versus Angular versus Ember versus whatever is, is ridiculous. It's and insane. It's, it's, it's crazy, like, to see, you know, and... Some people love one over the other, and, and sometimes it's really just about what fits the project at that time, you know, yeah. or, and, and just moving forward. you got to always move you gotta, forward. you got to get it done. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you can't just sit there and talk about it all day. Um, I remember reading so many of those posts, and I know it's ridiculous, but I think after this project is over, I'm going to write one of my own. <laughs> um, <laughs> part of that is... Because I they I don't think that they do the same thing. It's really funny, but you really do have to look at the requirements of the project. And the scope changed, and that was one thing that changed. But by the end of it, I had to do a ton of front-end validation. And Ember, you can do that in with Ember Validate. But with Angular, it takes two seconds to add, like, uh, ng uh, replace or ng preg. You can do, like, a... Uh, actually in your HTML, which does feel kind of dirty, but like you're, you're just able to say this has to be a number, this has to be something between 1 and 5, you can only have 4 in there, and it'll already do it for you. So I, I know we, we could get into it forever, but I, I really don't think, I'm, I probably am going to end up writing a post because they're not for the same thing. And um, one thing that I did learn from the, the panel um, that I thought was really interesting is uh, I always thought backend looked like really verbose, like you had to write a lot in order to, sorry, uh, backbone. I always thought it looked really verbose, like you had to write a lot to get anything done. Um, but after talking to some of the guys um, during the panel and before the panel, when we were trying to figure out topics, I'm, I'm really intrigued to see the backbone and react pair, uh, pair that a couple of them talked about. 
Um, one of the things about Ember data, uh, one of the things about Ember that's amazing is Ember data, which helps you keep track of your models. Um, and Backbone has models and collections kind of at the forefront, whereas um, Angular, you've got to add some add some libraries to do that. Um, and uh, it's ridiculous, but I think next project I get the chance to do, which I have one in mind coming up, I might try the Backbone React. And if that doesn't work out, then I'll just, you know, scrap it and <laughs> rewrite it in something I'm comfortable in. Yeah, that's cool. I think... What I'm most interested and worried about at the same time is what happens once the API drops, because like you said, there are so many different choices, and I would kind of prefer that there was just a standard way of doing it, like Backbone ships in WordPress, right? So right. it would be great if it was just like, Backbone is the WordPress way, and everyone should use Backbone. Right. But it's definitely not going to be that way, and <laughs> no one really cares if it is that way or not. Uh, everyone is just happy to be able to use their own framework of choice. And I think that's fantastic, and like you said, you know, it gets used for different purposes, so some need one over the other. Uh, but I'm afraid of it leading to the, the community kind of splitting off into different factions, uh, advocating for their own framework of choice, and then having WordPress sort of diverge in these different directions where now developers can't go and work from, you know, one platform, one project to the next as easily, uh, whereas previously it was, this is all WordPress, so, you know, I can go and do anything as long as... I'm familiar with the WordPress functions. Do you yeah. guys think it's going to be like a, a bigger version of like, you know, if you either have the, you know, the WordPress standard or you go off and you do Genesis or something like that? Do you think it's going to be is even more fragmented than that? You mean like theme frameworks, like people yeah. choosing yep. Sage or Genesis or Canvas? Okay. Um yeah, I guess it'll kind of be similar to that because uh, I think there are already a few different projects out there for being able to go and write themes using the API, like th mm -hmm. API-based theme frameworks. And I think there will definitely be a few different flavors of that. Yeah, I, that's an interesting question. But in general, I think that part, part of the whole weirdness about the separation is everybody has their own tool, everybody has their own flavor they want to use. That diversity is really good. Like, uh, being somebody on the Sage team who works on Sage, I'm very glad there's other theme options. Um, it's obvious that Sage isn't the one starter theme to use for everybody, and I like that variation. Um, when I, A long time ago when I was doing research, I actually totally got why WordPress decided to use Backbone. Um, it's one of those reoccurring themes that a lot of Word, WordPress core developers, they do make a good choice based on what can we support uh, long term for our backwards compatibility requirements, and also what's not going to ever necessarily get in the way uh, so that we can do what we need to do. I would say Backbone's extremely flexible, and it doesn't get a, it doesn't get in the way. It doesn't have quite as rigid requirements as Ember, and again. I should say. I'm, I'm not an expert, so I could absolutely be wrong, and I'm sure in some opinions, uh, some people's opinions, I am. Um, but I do think looking looking at it, um, I do respect that choice of Backbone, and um, I do think that, yeah, maybe, maybe it'll be a little weird and fragmented, but again, this is the beauty of um, APIs. Um, we can have separate opinions on how a front end should work, separate opinions on how a back end should work, and that's totally okay because as long as the endpoints stay the same, um, we could move from WordPress to Laravel to Rails to Express to Sales, and then on the front end we could have an Ember application that turns into an Angular application that turns into a React application. Um, that freedom is actually something I'm I've definitely been excited about all this you know JavaScript buzzword stuff and and uh, one thing that I think is probably good for the community in general part of the awesomeness of that is that I think it will bring lots of different types of developers into the community so like yeah. before everything has to be H be PHP so you kind of have to be okay. a PHP developer though I think as WordPress started to mature, we got a lot of people coming from different developer backgrounds, like lots of .NET developers starting to use uh, WordPress itself. But once there's mm -hmm. that freedom there to use any JavaScript framework you want, then people that are base, you know, would call themselves JavaScript developers would be like, oh, I can use WordPress for my data right. storage and whatever in the back end, and then do whatever I do best with the front end using right. JavaScript. Or maybe putting their own you know, uh, taste of 
back end in there too because you can right. go and swap out your admin interface and stuff, I suppose, with the API, right? Mm -hmm. And super exciting. I mean, that's yeah. just that is exciting, bringing a lot of people into the community. And um, it is a very nurturing, helpful community. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. And so being able to have more people come in and, and do that, uh, it's I'm pretty psyched. <laughs> So you mentioned before that you did a talk on uh, advanced custom fields. Yeah. Uh, I know that there's, uh, and Tom has been following it pretty closely as far as the, the fields API and stuff. Mm -hmm. what, what are you, have you looked into that or been in yeah. those discussions? Yeah, um, the fields API is, well, was maybe even more exciting to me when I first heard about it uh, than the JSON API, probably because I had less experience with um you know, messing with that. But I think um, my agency uses advanced custom fields a lot. Um, it helps provide um, a really clean interface for our uh, people, um, you know, our clients or maybe the people who are entering content. Um, we tend to do kind of like a home-built page builder with uh, flexible content fields and repeaters, which is actually something that, you know, you mentioned, Tom, was <laughs> can sometimes be a performance issue when you're storing the data in that way and, and keeping it like that um, by default. Um, and I honestly don't know a ton about it um, because thank God for caching, right? But um, in general, in general, you know, we use it a lot because the UI is really slick. And if we could get a more WordPress-y hookable uh, UI, um, or experience, sorry, that, that also is able to provide the UI that I think people are used to in WordPress. Really, really easy to use, really comfortable, um, very accessible as well. Um, that, um, that's really exciting. Uh, I remember Mike um, Schnenkel uh, from Atlanta, uh, he gave a talk at uh, LoopConf about... Um, WP the Lib. WP Lib. Yep, he was kind of telling me about that before he gave the talk at LoopComp. Um, he had mentioned to me that he was kind of interested in that library, and that's kind of how we got into talking about it, uh, working on it. And when I heard that from him, I was really excited. I do love WordPress's easy hooks and filters, so if we're able to easily get into stuff like that. Um, and not have to have any external dependencies or uh, worry about licensing for libraries. That's super exciting. Kind of on that note, um, we have been transitioning to, like if we build a custom plugin that has a lot of custom post types and data that needs to follow the, uh, the client around without the theme necessarily, um, we have been using and bundling CMB2 um, either if we're doing it with Composer for that plugin or if we're doing it um, with just like a Git submodule or something like that and then updating when we need to. Um, there's a couple, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but um, Justin is a friend of mine and also from North Carolina, and uh, CMB2 has been uh, a delight to work with, and I am really excited that it is so easy to work with. Um, creating the fields is great as a developer because <laughs> you can type them in instead of having to drag and drop them. Um, yeah. I think when I first started, Advanced Custom Fields was exciting to me because I didn't have to write the code. But now that I'm a developer, developer, um, <laughs> I think it's definitely a little bit, it's a little bit easier. It's a little bit easier to see the present state of the application and where the post meta goes when it's in your code. Um, so that's that's super exciting and, and uh, it's been a really good middle of the road transition to when we get this fields API. I hope that they take a lot of stuff from, uh, or take a lot of concepts from CMB2 and um, and start to move those in, because uh, I think they're really well done. Definitely, I think a lot of it is about making it flexible for developers to create things more easily. Because I mean, a lot of developers, when it comes to using custom fields plugins, they're like, why would I use this? I understand how to create a meta box. But right. the point is to go and cut down that dev time. And when you have functions on the back end that are going to take care of data sanitation, yeah. uh, sanitization, then that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Because it's doing things the right way. And part of the problem with custom fields plugins as they exist now is when they're abstracting things away, sometimes it abstracts it to the point where you're not always totally sure uh, at the 
onset of a project, how it's going and saving that data. So when we were talking about repeating fields before, uh, the issues that come in with it are, oh, this is a great UI. But then on the back end, you see that it's going and it's saving things with a postfix just with the number of the row. So then if you think that you can go and query by that field, then you're going to have a bad time because <laughs> you're yeah. doing complex like meta queries and there are like, multiple meta queries going on there. So if you have a large data set, then you can go and crash your site. Yeah. And, and uh, Tom, we were talking about it. You also work on, is it Fields Manager? Is yeah, that Field Manager. Called? And I haven't gotten to play with that yet, but um, I am going to totally try it just if I, I, if I can get some free time because it is good to know the options that are available. And if there are options um, saving uh, data more efficiently, uh, with those heavy queries, I actually have run into it a few times with the repeater, and I've had to get around it. Um, because um, there definitely have been times where I'll run a query. Uh, maybe I have, like, this one lawyer site I had, I think, I don't know, like 70 attorneys, and then each attorney had a practice area, and they were each post types, but, like, it was built, I guess maybe it was built in a repeater, but I remember the page load to build that whole query and output that HTML was <laughs> not acceptable. So, <laughs> so, you know, getting around the ways that we save data and being aware of that, um, is super important, and I, I honestly wish I knew more about the performance benefits and downsides with each one. Um, it's probably something I should I should probably spend some more time looking into if I ever get uh, if once we hit a project that needs that kind of like scale of repeaters or something like that. Mm -hmm. Part of the nice thing about something with the repeaters that I think could be done in core if it decides to go and implement repeating fields uh, would be the ability to go and choose how you're saving that. Uh, yeah. On that note, having a consistent saving experience is super important <laughs> with data portability. But, uh, for example, if things need to go and be indexable, uh, having the option to go and create that, or maybe natively it's going and separate, saving them as separate uh, meta fields that can go and be indexed. Because... Uh, with Field Manager, for example, we have an option to go and allow a field in a repeater to be indexable. And I would guess that plugins like CMB2 by Web Dev Studios or Custom Meta Boxes by Human Made uh, have similar options like that as well. Because they, they're all agencies that are doing um, building very high traffic websites with large data, and they have to be doing things efficiently. So uh, yeah. if they didn't provide an experience like that, then uh, I don't they would just go and write their own custom meta boxes themselves instead of using a plugin to do it, right? Exactly. Absolutely. And we, we, you know, we do. I would say high traffic is our high traffic is probably very different from some of you know some of the things you've worked on, Tom, and and like I mean you know Vogue. I'm not sure that we've ever had a traffic spike like that other than a stupid thing that I made that was like Reddit famous for like one day. And other than that, I haven't had to deal with. Um, I haven't had to deal with big traffic like that, but even just getting data, a lot of it, like with that example I had about the, the lawyer's website, it uh, can be at least, if not taxing on your hosting on your server, um, it can be pretty taxing on that, that person who doesn't get the lucky transient saved data. <laughs> right? <laughs> sure. Wait eight seconds. Se seconds. No, no, nothing's that bad. So, uh, so Julie, what, yeah. what fun stuff are you working on right now? So the big one is um, finishing up that project that I was talking about. Um, I told you guys a little about the Ember Angular difference thing, um, but I uh, didn't tell you a lot about what it is. Um, that project right now is a um, request for quote builder for a company who makes like architectural grill like vents. Um, for like really swanky events for um, industrial applications, like really big buildings. Um, they make some beautiful stuff, but there's thousands of different kinds, like permutations of, of the type of grill. You can have all these different cores, like all these different sizes, uh, all these different patterns, like materials and finishes and powder coat colors and all this crazy stuff. So that that application is the one that I was kind of talking about at the end. It's just an email. It's <laughs> we just have to send an email, but it's the journey up to that email that is takes so much time. Um, the other thing I'm really excited to get to work on. Um, we've done a little bit of work for them, but have to stop based on them being so busy. Um, one of our local breweries here called Wicked Weed Brewing. Um, they do some amazing. They've, they've grown so much in the last couple years. They do some really amazing – they make some amazing beers. And um, 
some of the beers there are not being done anywhere else in the United States. Their sour, like, barrel-aged program is huge. They have um, over, like, 400 different kinds of barrels that they get in and age their beer in. Um, they also scored a fooder, and a fooder is a huge wine barrel. It's, like, three times a, three times or four times as tall as me and probably maybe, like, two or three of me wide, uh, it's huge. <laughs> and, you, like, you could live in a fooder. So <laughs> so it's like a little yurt almost. But, um, yeah, like, they do some amazing stuff. They have such a wide variety of beers. They've only been open for a couple years, uh, maybe three, and they already have over 300 beers that they've made. They've made 72 different saisons, and I am a beer geek. I do live in Asheville. Um, my dad's a brewer, so I've kind of grown up around it, and it's really exciting we're going to build um, a, a really cool beer page for them. And I'm actually looking to add, uh, use the API or some type of API for that where I can kind of call based on all these different parameters. And then that's going to let you be able to um, visit the site and kind of pick what beers you like. So maybe you like IPAs or bitter beers. It, we can help you find beers that are like that and that you might be interested in trying. Um, I mean, Wicked Weed has a beer that's, like called cucumber, like it's like the cool cucumber is what it's called, but it tastes like kind of like cucumber water, and it's super good. Um, there's all these different like wacky beers, and people might not think they're good until they realize that they've drank something like it. So if we can help suggest beers and get people engaging with their website, um, that's definitely something that we're uh, we're really excited about building. On that site as well, we're actually going to use a lot of WordPress's native posting like media. Uh, stuff right out that it comes right out of the box that it's so good at. Um, we're going to be building uh, WikiWeed. It's like a kind of learning resource uh, portion of that site, and uh, it probably won't evolve. Probably won't be too much uh, at the beginning of the project once we launch it because we've got we've got to write the content first. But um, eventually, there will be a good area to kind of learn about tasting craft beer, um, how you should go about doing that, and and why you might um, like to drink a sour, even if you've never had one before. So, you know, fun projects like that. All the stuff we do are, like, one-off things. So I launch them out into the wild. They get used. Um, and then uh, and then we, we see how well we did. And then we just pick up the next project and go. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, this has been great, Julian. I mean, just to talk about WordCamps, the API... And beer. I mean, what, <laughs> beer. what more can a dev want, right? I mean, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you again, Julian. Where can uh, people reach reach out to you and say thanks? Yeah, so um, my Twitter handle is uh, just my name, Julian Melissus. Um, my website is julianmelissus.com. It's not super popular or well-posted. Um, I think the last thing I posted, I just copied and pasted a WordCamp Ipsum that my friend generated and just pasted that into a post <laughs> because that's as much time as I had to post about WordCamp. Um, but um, we're there. You can find our agency's website at craftpeak.com. Um, that's C-R-A-F-T-P-E-A-K. Um, I'll be honest, it doesn't have anything on it. Um, and that's because a lot of our business comes word of mouth. Um, we stay really busy and... Um, you know, just get to do exciting stuff like that. So uh, you can find me also. I think I'm available on the Slack there. But if you do have roots questions or sage questions, you can reach out to me there as well. Or um, we do have a discourse forum that I like to remind people um, we're on all the time answering questions. So if you go to discourse.roots.org with those, or sorry, .io with that uh, information, you can you can find me there too. Cool. Thanks. Tom, yeah. where can people uh, reach out to you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Tom Harrigan. My website is thomasharrigan.com. Uh, YouTube at Tom Press. And, uh, well, I'm at Alley Interactive. And, uh, you know, we're looking for devs if you're interested. Uh, also, I, I want to say thanks, Julian, for all the WordCamp stuff. Uh, it's definitely good for me to keep in mind. I'll be running the Contributor Day at uh, WordCamp New York City. So awesome. uh, always good to have some insight on <laughs> what what others have uh, battled through before me. And uh, I, hope to come to that. I hope to come to that one as well. It was on my calendar for last time. I wasn't able to make it, but um, that's definitely one I'd like to make. So maybe, maybe I'll see you there. It's a lot of hard work, but it, it does pay off. Yeah, totally. And it's during Halloween too, so 
Yeah. Should be awesome. Sweet. Halloween and developers. Awesome. This year? Isn't that this year? Uh, yeah, this October. So this in October. Like, what month are we in? Like We're two in, months. What month are we in? We're about to be in August, I think. Yeah, so it's <laughs> end of October. It's like two months away. Sweet. Yep. All right, thanks, guys. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, like you said, I don't get to podcast a ton, but with all this stuff, podcasting I've been doing recently, it makes me want to do it more. So, um, uh, and I know everybody else, uh, organizers that you guys invited on, they really wanted to be on. They weren't able to make it for one reason or another, but uh, they do say hi. And um, I, you know, I couldn't do it without them. So definitely, big hand to the whole team for WordCamp Asheville. And also, again, thanks to you guys for having me on. Totally. It was a lot of fun coming there, and I always wanted to visit Asheville, so uh, you know they, they made it a very welcome experience, so hope to come back cool. again soon. Jason, Jason where can yep. they uh, find you? Uh, I'm at, at Rez on Twitter, and Rez.com, that's with three Zs. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to be able to speak at WordCamp New York, so we'll see. We'll see. Cool. That's why I was kind of asking that would be my first speaking <laughs> gig at a WordCamp, so that's okay. why I was asking that before. So nice. Hopefully we'll see you there. Um, so I want to thank everybody for tuning in as well. Um, if you want to see when our next show is, which we're pretty consistent now. We're, I think we're three Mondays in a row now, so um, we're going to keep that going. Uh, but if you want to get tips and tricks from us and, and get more interaction with us, please feel free to go to our site, wpdevtable.com slash subscribe. Also, please remember to like and share and subscribe on iTunes. Uh, and YouTube, of course, and feel free to comment on the site as well to join in on the discussion. And if you're a first-time developer, uh, first-time viewer, I should say, um, <laughs> if you're a first-time developer, even better, <laughs> uh, then be sure to uh, catch up on all of our past shows at our website as well and get let's get your dev on. I think I'm going to have to go binge listen as well. Here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Good night, guys. Jess. Bye, guys.